little um, disclaimer in the chat just so that everyone's aware that um, for privacy purposes that we are sharing this and using it for marketing purposes. OK, so welcome. This is our uh, second session. We had one yesterday, but we're going to talk about the Animal Health Technology Program. And um, I'll introduce myself. I'm Dr. Pamela Barmentlow. I am an instructor and the program head for the Animal Health Tech Program. And joining me today is Amy Cusack. You want to introduce Hi. yourself? Uh, so yeah, so my name is Amy and I am one of the instructors um, at the college. I'm a registered vet tech um, and I actually went to Lakeland College way back when and graduated and worked in practice for just about eight years and this is my eighth year um, at Lakeland. So I'd just like to welcome everybody to our session today. Thanks, Amy. You gave me a second to open up my PowerPoint because I had not opened it up yet. Uh, and. Well, we're both here to answer questions for you. Any questions that you may have, Amy sort of helping moderate and letting me know when you have questions, ask questions throughout. Um, that's no problem. Um, it's very informal because we're basically here to answer your questions and see um, hopefully you're interested in the program or have been um, conditionally accepted to the program and are coming next year but um, we'll kind of give a brief overview of the program, um, talk about some of the prospects of career um, opportunities after you're done, and um, we don't really go too much in depth about the admissions. There's, um, we do know a bit about the, <laughs> the requirements and everything that you need to get in, but in terms of specific and um, particular um, details about admissions, there is a specific admission session as well. So without further ado, I will share my screen now and my PowerPoint and we'll start. Going through that. There we go. I just muted everyone else, but feel free. There's just um, if you don't know where the chat is, there's just a little chat on the top there. Um, it's a little speech bubble on your teams. And then if you want to put your hand up, there's a little hand up icon and. Um, if you want to ask questions, we'll we'll see that. So you should be able to see my screen now. Um, we'll start talking about the program. Sorry, a technical glitch here. My screen is not showing the active PowerPoint. There we go. So what does an animal health technologist do? Um, we can classify them as veterinary paraprofessionals, but really what is that? So um, if you're involved as an AHT, which we'll talk about the designations afterwards, because um, in practice, a certified AHT is actually called a re registered vet tech or RVT. And they are involved in so many aspects of the um, clinic. So they do assist the veterinarian, but they're not, um, as some people think of them, just simply nurses of um, veterinarians because a human nurse um, doesn't do as much as, um, doesn't have as broad of a scope as an animal health technologist does in animal um, and veterinary medicine. So you could be involved in, um, or you are involved as an RVT in, um, doing x-rays, so you're also an x-ray tech. You are doing lab work, so running urine samples, blood samples, um, fecal samples. You're doing um, anesthesia, so you're monitoring anesthesia. And um, while the vet is doing surgery, sometimes you're called in to assist with surgery um, while the veterinarian is doing that. Um, you're doing nursing care, so administering medications. Um, and charting and 
keeping track of medical records, filling prescriptions, um, involved with client communication and client care, and also dentistry. So um, you'll be, uh, vet techs are doing um, scaling and polishing of teeth during dentistry. Um, in the program, you are a registered member of the Alberta Veterinary Medical Association. So this is a regulatory organization. It's our governing body that keeps us accountable to the public and also makes sure that we're following um, all of the checking the boxes and making sure that we're up to speed with current knowledge and information, making sure that we have um, credible um, education so that we're um, providing a consistent service and doing our best um, services to um, the animals and clients that we serve. So in our college, we're in Alberta, so we um, are under the Alberta Veterinary Medical Association, but each province has their own association um, that you're under their umbrella, so you have to become a member in order to practice within that province. So when you're here as a student, you still have to be a member of the Alberta Veterinary Medical Association. So that's not something that you have, like you have to pay to be a member, but that's part of your um, your student fees here. So you don't have to um, add that on or tack that on to the tuition, but um, it does allow you to, you know, participate in labs and do all of the um, activities like giving injections and, and participating in surgery and anesthesia and radiology labs um, under the uh, ABVMA and be um, in their organization. Also, they have resources where you can find jobs, um, continuing education, and if you do choose to work as a summer student in Alberta, you um, will be you don't have to pay for a membership then you can just um, work as a student in any clinic um, if you are to go to a different province um, say if you're from saskatchewan you would have to go under the saskatchewan governing body which is the svma or saskatchewan veterinary medical association So again, um, we'll talk about um, after graduation from the this program, you would go on um, to take the licensing exam, the veterinary tech national exam. And then once you pass that, then you would become an official member, not a student member, but a practicing RVT under the ABVMA. And, and then you would be free to do all of the activities that they um, allow RVTs to participate in in clinic. So where would you work after you complete this diploma and um, graduate with your AHT diploma? So most people think um, the vet clinic is the most common place that people go to and within that there's many different types of vet clinic practices. There's emergency practices, specialty practices that specialize in, you know, large animal surgery, in small animal surgery, um, in emergency, in internal medicine. There's um, specific large animal clinics or ambulatory clinics as well. There's also feedlots will hire RVTs as well as dairy barns at our dairy barn here on campus is actually um, run by a um, RVT. She graduated in Ontario and then she moved out here and has been running it and doing an excellent job. And you can work in swine barns, in research facilities, so with lab animals and or um, running samples and um, more clean pathology. Zoos and wildlife, this is always a popular one because who doesn't want to work with a um, baby deer or a wild tiger, right? So those are well um, sought after jobs, but um, certainly wildlife rescues um, and even some, um, like we had a fellow that was working with the Wildlife um, Association and, and so there's just many opportunities. Um, pet food and pharmaceutical companies and the CFIA, which is the Can Canadian Food Inspection Agency, 
they have a opportunities for um, vet techs to work in the um, meat inspection or public health side. So the opportunities and the chances of getting a job after graduating is very good. Um, we are a highly sought out profession, um, both veterinarians and vet techs. Um, there's a high demand. So uh, you're likely if, you know, if you're willing to work, you're going to be able to. The wages typically around 18 to 22 dollars to start. Um, and depending on the clinic, you may also include health and dental benefits, um, membership dues, which is those fees that you have to pay to be part of the um, whatever association is in your province. Sometimes they'll also include a uniform allowance, so for scrubs or lab coats or scrub jackets and coveralls and a continuing education allowance as well. So here are some of the things that we do in our labs during your time here in first and second year. Um, on the website does go through all the specific courses there are for first year and second year, um, but you kind of jump right in into um, you know animal handling as soon as you get here into um, learning how to identify surgical instruments and surgical prep and anesthetic machines and then you go into um, second semester and you're learning anesthesia so this um, student is uh, monitoring anesthesia and um, we go into more animal handling labs and giving injections and um, calculating drug dosages and administering those intramuscular and sub Q and taking IV blood collection. So we kind of get you and you hit the ground running pretty quickly. Here's one of our students doing a surgical prep on a dog and some joining in on surgery. So they're scrubbed in helping. Um, this is one of our other vets, Dr. Robin Rogers and she's doing surgery and some students are assisting her. And here's um, one of our models. So we do try to do everything or we do everything first on models um, so that you guys can get the practice in and then we move over to live animals. That's part of our animal care um, commitment so that we're not just throwing you in there right on live animals. So this is a Sindaver model and it is, um, as you can see, it's not covered in fur, but it is a lifelike, um, really all of the an an anatomy is very accurate and it's a good model for intubating and, um, and doing other techniques on giving injections and such. And, um, taking blood because it has all of the anatomical features. It has veins, it has nerves and um, muscles as you can see and it's um, a good model to practice. So this student is using it to intubate so she's putting a tube down into its trachea so we can administer medication or administer gas anesthetic and oxygen. There's a picture of Amy and she's helping a student administer or put in an IV catheter. These pictures that they're not wearing masks are obviously pre COVID. So here's a, it looks like an animal handling lab. This is one of our other ed lab techs, Tracy Allen. And they're taking some blood from a dog there. And radiographing a horse's foot. And there's some students doing a dental on a dog. And here is the lab procedures. So a lot of microscopes looking, if you like looking at cells real close up, they are um, actually looking for parasites in feces. So. And this is a, um, so you will be filling prescriptions. And like I said, client care is a big aspect of 
um, being uh, any veterinary professional really. So um, you can be take, filling these prescriptions for patients, taking calls about um, medications, talking to them about side effects and uh, on discharge, going through how to administer the medication properly. So that's a really important aspect of the job as well as um, tracking everything um, medically. So making sure that all of the inventory is correct and that we have all of the important um, medications and um, other supplies in stock for the clinic and um, making sure that everything's done accurately is so that we are giving the best patient care and that the owners go home understanding what their um, expectations are and, and what to see or if something is normal that they see as a side effect for their animal then they're not going to be as concerned. So we really want to encourage good client compliance because that of course helps the animals ultimately. I'm just going to check for there's no questions Amy. No, 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 there hasn't been any questions. Not yet. I just, so you guys feel free to ask any questions. Um, we'll answer whatever, whatever's on your mind. So don't be shy. Yeah, it's just a really quiet group. Yesterday we had lots of questions and I just see that Al, it was um, something popped up that there was a um, notification, but it's just that Alan has put in the chat um, to enter your name into to win some Apple prizes, so that's excellent. So we also um, have taught in the past about rehab and um, that is something that can be done as um, now more sort of after um, after graduation you can learn and do more um, further training in certain areas. So rehab is one of those areas you can go and do further training in many areas, anesthesia, dentistry, um, clean path. And um, it's certainly an, a growing area or growing field in our industry where um, we're helping these injured and, um, and or um, rehabilitating after surgery so that animals have the best range of motion and quality of life and um, athletic ability that they possibly can. So we have um, a dog here and I think this is one of Robin's dogs and they're doing some activities with him. So, you know, underwater treadmills and um, these donuts and, and balance devices to help um, regain strength in, in our canine and um, other patients. So here's another handling lab. It looks like they're working with some dairy calves there. And we used to have goats. We now work primarily on sheep for small ruminants, but we have had goats off and on as well throughout the program. And here's a student taking a tail, um, tail vein blood sample from a cow. There's Amy again. And we do have some exotic labs, so you will get exposed to some of the um, exotic species and wild animals as well, and um, lab, animal med lab animal medicine. So here's some students examining a rabbit. And this is when we, um, went to the WCVM. They have a lab animal facility there and the students were able to do a full lab on how to handle rats and mice. If that's something that you love. And we do have our student led clinic. So this is a um, course that the students do in second year and there's um, three teams. There's a retail team and a public relations team and a clinic organization team. Um, so the retail team, they stock the store, they um, do promotions, they sell items and of course do inventory and keep track of sales um, and revenue, which is a great um, aspect of learning for the front end side and the client communication and same with team PR. So there's just a slide here of um, 
the public relations. So they do more work with the community and promoting our program and our profession to so they're um, networking with industry partners doing um, events such as the career fair and um, continuing education events so continuing education is where you know after you're done your degree or your diploma you go on and you learn more about um, more current therapies or um, developments in the industry and um, a lot of times it's put on by industry reps, so pharmaceutical reps that are, have more information about vaccines um, and drugs or pet food companies, just so that you're current with all your information. So um, once we're done school, we don't finish. We continue to learn and um, develop as professionals. So it's important to develop those good connections with industry because oftentimes you're calling them and asking them questions about their products or about what's new and, and what they're finding because they do all the research that contributes to all of these um, technologies and therapies that we are implementing. But these students are all going out into a local school and they take dogs that have been assessed um, to be good um, sound behavioral wise and um, that they have the correct vaccination and protection and they go into the school and the kids will sit with them and read with them. So it's kind of good for the students, both sides, for you know, our college students, the HT students, as well as the um, elementary school students that they're working with. It's been a good partnership. So here's part of our one of the career fairs that we ran. And um, so there's a student talking to a prospective employer. So it's good at connecting them to um, industry, uh, the clinics that are looking for practicum students and um, graduates to hire. They are able to come and talk to um, students about uh, what their clinic is, what's involved in their clinic, what kind of work and all of the details of the position. And we just have a question regarding the student led clinic. And so this question's from Grace and she says for the student led yeah. uh, that clinic groups, are you assigned to a group or do you get to choose what group you want to be in? So um, you we have you guys apply for the teams and everyone puts in their name for which team that they would like to be on. And so we try to get you onto the team that um, you would like to be on. Um, that being said, we split them evenly. So if there's more people that are looking at one team versus another, we will spread it out and take some people and put them onto the team that is not, um, doesn't have as many people. And we typically will get you to list like your first choice, your second, your second choice and your third choice. So yeah. um, hopefully you can get your first choice, but on, unfortunately that's not always the case, but every team is pretty cool. And I mean, they're, they're very well-rounded teams. And so you get to kind of experience, you know, every kind of aspect um, of the clinic. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't be um, at a loss if you didn't get on the team that you chose first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I didn't talk much. This is our clinic organization. So this is the third um, student led clinic and they um, contribute in terms of more of the um, they're more the organizers and the planners. So they set schedules for and they um, go through the clinic and do what we call clinic duty and clinic cleaning. So they go through and check that we have enough syringes and needles in all the drawers and that we have enough inventory for um, all the labs and they do biosecurity. So they put up posters and make sure that people are washing their hands and dipping their boots and doing all the appropriate protocols to follow so that we don't spread diseases um, from patient to patient or around the farm here as well. And we do have opportunities also for people to um, switch and, and help on different teams as well. And we're talking more about that of having cross team work and um, doing things within each team so that you get the skills because each team kind of has a, um, a little bit of a unique set of skills that they get to learn and experience. This is going back to team PR. <laughs> so we're we do do have some fun here and this is a student who is dressed up as Santa and they took um, photos with Santa 
for Christmas. So you can bring your pet in and get their pet's picture with Santa on its or the pet on Santa's knee. And uh, this is a fundraiser, though. So they do fundraise to help local organizations and specifically our SPCAs so that they um, can continue to run and um, do good services to the community. So this is one of our fundraisers. We've also bought um, these pet therapy dogs that we've donated to um, the local extended care um, so that they have um, these little pet therapy dogs that help to give them company and companionship. And this is one of the um, other initiatives. It's part of all of the teams do the um, de-stress rooms actually. So again, something that all of them are involved in and these are where we take animals to a room and during stressful times of the year, like midterm time, um, final exam time, all of the students on campus can come in and spend some time playing and petting and um, just have a, a stress break or a study break and come and enjoy some cute little puppies and, and some bigger really fun dogs and cats as well. So here's one of our graduating classes. We always take a class picture at the end of the year when everyone goes, oh, phew, we're all done. And that was incredible, but they're glad to be going out into and graduating and going into practice. We do go on field trips and um, we used to do one in first and second year. I think now we're just doing one in second year and um, we've gone to Saskatoon, some years we've gone to Calgary, and some years we've gone to Edmonton. We have in the past also traveled to conferences in other um, provinces or we used to go to the states, but that's travel is dependent on um, on restrictions. So here's a Body Worlds exhibit that they went to. Pretty cool. And it looks like a police training dog facility. We often will go to a clinic that is specialized or like an um, emergency clinic and do a lab on CPR. So that's what these ladies are showing the students here. We used to go to Guardian and Westwind Animal Hospital. So that's an equine specialty clinic. Uh, Pam, Katie just had a question. She wanted to know how many students are admitted each year. Um, we admit 72 uh, first year students. Yeah. Thanks, Amy. You bet. And the, this is the exam. So um, this is the national licensing exam for Canada and, and the US, right, Amy? Yeah, it's a North American, so the Vet Tech yeah. National Exam, it's, it's written um, by both American yeah. and Canadian students. Yeah, because one of our instructors here, she goes to the, um, or she has worked with them in making the questions for the exam, and it's in the States. So, so when you'll have to take this exam, it's a couple months after you graduate, and there's a couple of sittings for the exam. And um, Amy, I'll let you talk to this, because you're, Sure, since Pam's never written the vt &E, she's not 100% sure all the ins and outs, but yes. Yeah. So once you complete um, your AHT program, you're requ required to do a six week practicum, um, you know, at a clinic kind of of your choosing, and then you have the opportunity to write the exam after that. Um, my suggestion would be to write the exam as soon as you can. Um, I wouldn't put it off months and months after graduation because some of those things just kind of start to, you know, leave your mind. So write it as soon as you can, but it's it's a, an exam that consists of about 200 multiple choice. Um, when I wrote it way back when, um, it was actually on paper, um, but now it's an online exam and you pretty much get your results um, as soon as you submit your answers, it'll be successful or non-successful. Um, and the way there's somebody had asked in the session yesterday about a pass mark. So there's nothing that says, okay, this is the exact mark you have to get. It's marked on a curve. So you have to, in order to pass, you have to have higher than the average um, or at average. And then if you're below average, then that would be an, an unsuccessful attempt. 
fortunately for students that you know aren't successful the first time they have the opportunity um, to write it um, again um, and it but it does cost money um, every time you write it and I think it's an American dollar so I'm not sure off the top of my head what the price is um, but I think it ends up being like 300 Canadian um, around there so yeah so like uh, like Pam said there are um, different sittings for it um, you would just have to kind of look um, through your association whenever you whatever province that you go to to find out kind of dates exact dates and exact locations for that um, but once you pass the exam then you become an RVT so as a student you're an animal health technologist when you write your vt &E and you pass you are now designated as a reg registered veterinary technologist perfect thank you you're welcome um Alan just posted about the animal health tech program um, blended online program, which is different than the one that um, I'm involved in on campus and myself and Amy teach in. So this is a, a separate program that requires, of course, a separate um, application. So if you were interested in doing it but didn't want to come to Vermilion and be here in person, you could also apply and try the um, blended online program. So you um, go to school, um, it starts in October, so you're going to be learning online and then going coming in to the um, campus um, for a one week intensive um, lab um, lab week where you're in person and, and doing all the labs for the courses that you took online. So we're accepting our first class um, and we just started the HT blended online um, for the first year and it just started last week. So that's um, and as Alan said, there's 24 students um, being accepted to that program per year. So as you know, our there is quite a bit of demand for the program as well. Um, there is usually a wait list and it is a fairly intensive program. So something to keep in mind that it's not um, really the lightest program or an easy where you can go out all the time and <laughs> and um, do lots of extracurricular. You really have to focus and and um, manage your time and be committed to the academic um, academic side of things. So why should we why should you come to Lakeland? We have a CVMA accredited program, which means um, when you graduate from our program, you can go to any pro province in Alberta and practice as long as you are um, you have to join the association that is um, governing your province but you don't have to take any further tests or do any practical or written tests as long as you've passed the program and the vt and &E, then you just have to apply and um, go whatever like some each province has their own registration process, which just kind of makes sure that you're on the right page about what their um, guidelines and policies and procedures and protocols are. But other than that, then you're free to um, go any of those places in Canada. And we have an accredited or approved facility and I have to bring up the stat 14,531 square feet of uh, labs, animal wards. Uh, we have a surgical suite, pharmacy, exam rooms. You saw the um, main lobby where we have our retail store. So it's quite an impressive facility. We just moved into it in 2018, so it's still very new. And we, when we built the facility, we had a um, budget to purchase all new equipment, which has been fabulous. We have all new anesthetic machines and microscopes and anatomy lab features and a new equine area that has stocks and um, bovine handling facility. So it's been wonderful to um, upgrade. We won't even go back to think about what the old facility that we used to teach in was. It was a old dairy barn that was converted to a clinic and it was much smaller and not as um, advanced and beautiful. 
So here's some of the animals that we bring in and we have partnerships with a couple of SPC SPCAs and um, particularly we use um, lots of animals from the Lloydminster and Bonneville SPCA for our labs and for kennel care as well. And we do have and our just a question about um sorry pam about the rodeo club alan maybe you can take the lead on this one is there a rodeo club presentation for today that i'm not sure i would assume so but i think alan's gonna i can see he's typing there so i'm just gonna answer that question for you faith yeah and we're gonna talk about clubs as well so here's a picture of our campus farm but um if you look behind me there's a better picture of the college <laughs> I guess it doesn't include the farm though. So um, this is an older picture. So here is where our old clinic used to be and this is where our new clinic is. And I don't believe, oh, this is where the new dairy barn facility is. So a few things have changed since this picture, but the main idea is that we have a farm right on site. So all of the cattle that you're going to be working with, dairy cows, um, we have a, a herd of schooling horses. They're all really nearby and um, we do use them quite frequently. So we have um, we have horse care that the clinic organization team does and um, and we do partner with the other um, programs and we did um, calving rotations and lambing rotations in the past. So we do get many opportunities to be involved in that. That's the new dairy facility. Um, we have a research, um, a commercial and um, a purebred herd of beef cows. Um, you can bring your friends to school with you. So here's some students that have brought their horses to college, which is really nice to be able to spend time with your horse and ride. We often see, or I often see horses riding, or people riding around on their horses, um, going through the provincial park and just enjoying some fresh air and getting outside with their animals, which is great. There's an, a dog in the stock dog club, maybe, <laughs> chasing some cows. Um, we have the AHT club. We have many um, other clubs, like someone just mentioned the rodeo club. There's some outdoor clubs on campus, um, a climbing club. So there's many opportunities to get involved. Here's our um, sort of close to home. We've got our AHT club and they often raise money and go on a field trip and just um, a place again where students can bond and socialize and um, you know talk about their classes and and how school is going and and do some fun things together as well get the outside of academic school experience which is super important as well So there are some transfer opportunities, more so um, I'd say the University of Lethbridge has an agreement as well as the University of Saskatchewan um, with transferring some of the courses if you do decide to go on and take further education um, if you want to get a degree afterwards. So those are some opportunities. And just couple last pictures. Here's a student who's really found a love for one of our um, adoptable SPCA animals. And here's a nice little kitty walking around. It looks like she's in the dairy bar. Well, might be in the um, arena there. We have to have barn cats to control the rodent population. So that is the end of the presentation. So I'll turn it over to anyone who wants any to ask any particular questions. Everyone's clear, no questions. Yeah, you guys are super quiet. Hello. Hi, Jenna. 
Hi, I um, just have a question if the volunteering has to be in a clinic or can it be a mobile vet? It, it has to be with a vet for sure. And um, I'm pretty sure that you can do it with a ambulatory vet as well. As long as it's associated with a practice, then you should yes. be fine. Yeah, okay. and you have to get those 40 hours and um, we do take that as well as the academics. Like you have to fill out a work experience evaluation after you're done your 40 hours. So filled out by the um, the people in your practice to say how you did on your work experience. And then we take that into account with your application as well as your academics in terms of acceptance. Okay, and can it be two different? Could you do 20 hours with one place and 20 with another? That would be something to check with admissions. I don't think that that would be a problem, but just double check with them. Thank you. You're welcome. I would just keep in mind though, when you do your volunteer hours, um, if it's a practice that you're thinking that you want to do your practicum in, um, you can't actually do your practicum where you've done your volunteer hours. So just that's something that you'll want to keep in mind as well. Anyone have any other questions? Feel free to speak up. We are here for you. <laughs> so Katie asked, I've completed my 40 hours. What do I need to submit them? So you do need to get that work experience evaluation and get them to fill that out and then send it in with your application. And make sure that you guys do get that in because you need to, you're welcome. You need to do that in order for it to be not, a, you know, to be accepted. No other questions? Oh, Megan says, do volunteer hours at a vet clinic count if the clinic is not in Alberta? Absolutely. As long as it's a registered vet clinic in the province that you're in, then you're fine. Yeah, you don't have to do it in Alberta. So Brooke says, where do I find the evaluation to submit? That is a good question. I'm not sure that I've ever it must be on the website in some form. Alan, do you know where they can find that form? Is Alan here still? I don't think he is. I think he must have left. And I, I honestly, I'm not sure if they are on the website or not, because I remember looking, I think, last summer for them. Um, yeah. So it might be yeah. a matter of getting hold a hold of the registrar um, or admissions because they would have all that and they could probably just email them to you. Yeah, so Brooke, just make sure that you ask the person, like someone in admissions, just call them and they should be able to get it to you. You're welcome. So just to mention to you guys that you can apply um, into the program without having your volunteer hours. You can get a conditional acceptance um, without those, but at some point before, you know, I don't know what the deadline actually is. So you could apply, get a conditional acceptance, and then do your volunteer hours after the fact, and then submit those as soon as you're done. So I would recommend um, if you don't have them done and you are accepted, try to get those um, hours um, completed and the forms completed and sent in um, just because you know I mean lots of it is based on marks but um, there is a high demand for the program so the sooner you can kind of get everything done um, it helps your chances for sure mm -hmm. I'm just going to the HTC website. I'm pretty sure it said on there when you're supposed to get your volunteer hours in.
And I just want to comment the picture that you see behind Pam. That's actually the Lloyd Minster campus. Um, it's not our Vermilion yes. campus. <laughs> I wish that was our Vermilion campus. That's a pretty nice little pond that they have going on there. Well, it doesn't say about the um, There we go. So I'll just share this with you guys. Um, Shelly just asked to when do you start accepting applications from grade 12 students? I think now. Yep. Anytime at this point. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so it is based on, like I said, you can get a conditional acceptance, but it is based on your final marks. So you mm -hmm. want to make sure that you, you know, keep your steady marks um, all the way through to the end of your semester or the end of your, your grade 12 year. Yeah, so if you get conditionally accepted, don't just give up on, you know, studying and preparing for your finals for grade 12 because um, we do only accept, you know, you after you submit those marks and if those marks aren't high enough, then you will not be accepted into the program. So conditionally accepted is just that it's condition on condition of your um, final grades of these courses and these are the minimums and I see Alan is typing and um, I don't know if he wants to speak to this specifically, but it is competitive. So, um, you know, this is just the minimums. The higher grades will give you a better chance of getting in. So um, you need a minimum of 50% in English 30-1, Chem 30, or 65% in English 30-2, 60% um, in Biology 30 and 60% in math 30-1 or 30-2. Um, and then it says you need to, you will be sent a work experience evaluation form and you need to um, complete it at a vet clinic within the past two years and you have to complete it by the middle of July before September, um, before you start. So by that summer, because it is kind of hard to, you know, get your hours while you're in school and everything else. So. And like some people said, there is a bit of um, difficulty at this time and hopefully it will improve um, to actually be able to go into a vet clinic and, you know, do your work experience hours because um, they're not really wanting a whole bunch of traffic and extra people coming in and out of their um, facility at this time. So like we said, try to do it as soon as you can, but we you do have up till the middle of July. So Megan says, can work hours in a vet clinic also be put along with volunteer hours? Um, I don't know that you can count those as volunteer hours. That would be also an admissions question. And Alan said applications opened October 1st. You can apply anytime. And application fees are waived today. Does anyone have any other questions? Co so Caitlin says, would, would co-op hours at a clinic work for the volunteer hours? Sorry, we'd have to default to admissions to make sure that you get the correct answer for that. Okay, because the purpose of the volunteer hours is to make sure that you understand, you know, so say you work in a vet, vet clinic or you're doing a co-op, um, but they don't specifically um, say to you, get you to do all of the different aspects of a clinic and experience um, what you would be doing in clinic over a broader area and say you're just working in the front end all of the time. Well, that's not really work experience. You're just working in the front end as a receptionist because that's what I did when I was in vet school. I worked at a clinic and I was a receptionist, but that doesn't really give you an idea of all of the aspects of your, the job. So the purpose of the volunteer hours is to show you what you'll be doing as, in a broader scope and give you a better idea of what 
to expect as an RVT and um, what the job roles would be in a clinic, not just getting particular experience, say if you're working in the back doing um, helping the vet with large animal exams or just doing inventory or ordering or you know you want to get volunteer hours to get experience in all of the aspects of a clinic. And that's what our, our program is designed or we're aiming to put out um, to graduate techs that are um, entry level techs, we call them. So somebody that who could go to any area, but isn't an expert in any particular area. They are just um, given the basic skills so that they can start out at an entry level and do a, a, a job at that, but not be like at the highest level because that's an experienced tech, someone that with time you build upon your skills and your knowledge and your experience and get better at it but you know we could you could work in a large animal clinic you could go to a specialty clinic you could go to lab animal but you're going to if you are going to a more specialty clinic if you are going to work in lab animal you're going to need a bit more experience and training um, to do all of the tasks so it's not that we're we're training you to be perfectionists or or high level um, specialty techs in this college. It's we're we're training you to be general all around good skill wise and academic wise and and able to graduate and complete the VT and E so that you can go out and get more experience, especially if you are going into more specialized. And we talked yesterday too that you can get a vet tech specialty upon graduating so that's a post graduate after your diploma you can go on and do um, a program where you can get a, a, a designated specialty in something just like vets do vets can take um, specialized training after their program where they have to do a certain amount of hours and they have to do a certain amount of extra um, education in that area and there's usually a testing involved in, in an application and a process that you go through um, in order to achieve uh, designation as a specialist. So just to add to that, that's becoming a VTS or a vet tech specialist. It's not something that you would get right out of school, like you go for training for a week and oh, you become a VTS. It's actually years and years and hours and hours of, you know, working in that designated specialty. So I think right now there's, I want to say 16 different um, academies um, and, you know, it could be dentistry, it could be anesthesia and analgesia, you know, large animal production. Um, I mean, the list kind of goes on and on. And so once you get into practice and, you you know, you're working for a little bit and you find that you really have an affinity for one kind of area, then you can start to consider, you know, maybe building on those those skills. Um, and then with your VTS, in order to become, you know, to get that specialty designation, like I said, it's going to take, you know, hours and hours, like we're, we're talking like thousands of hours. Um, and then you have to do a set number of case studies where you would have to submit, um, you know, a, a paper on each kind of case study. Um, and then they're analyzed by, you know, the organization, NAFTA, uh, the National or North American Vet Tech Association. Um, and then you would have to get letters of recommendation. Then you have to write an exam. And so, like, even if you put all of this work in hours and hours and, you know, your 50 case studies, whatever the case may be, it's 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 hard to do. It's, it's a lot of extra work, um, but it, it pays off in the end. But just because you do all that work, if you're not successful in your exam, then you would have to kind of start over, maybe not completely start over, but you may have an opportunity to take that exam again. But yeah, it's it's not something that you're going to do like day one on, on um, you know, first day of the job, um, but it's something to consider for sure. Um, and it will take a little bit of time, but I think in the end, it's really worth it. We do have one um, uh, RVT on staff who has her VTS in clinical pathology, um, Brianne Bellwood. And so she is one of our instructors and it's it took her a while to get it. Um, but she did. And yeah, it's great. It's, it's absolutely excellent to have somebody, you know, with her caliber of skills um, in our program, for sure. That's great. Any other questions?
Well, I'll let you guys go on. I know there's other sessions to go to. It's almost 11 here, so I appreciate you all coming in and um, listening to our program. We're obviously excited to have you. We're excited to um, about our program. We uh, obviously <laughs> think it's an excellent program and enjoy teaching in it and enjoy the students as well. So um, we hope that you uh, are considering it and if you have any further questions um, feel free to contact Alan in um, as our academic advisor our admissions department or myself or Amy as well and you can find us on our on the website okay thank you all and have a great day